So I'm Andrea Twisbrooks. I'm at the University of Chicago, and I'm going to talk to you about a um, project that um, we undertook there, um, as well as with a number of other institutions. So we called it a day in the life um, mapping project. So we had a couple of goals when we started out. Um, uh, we wanted, uh, first of all, the, the groups that were involved were um, health science libraries in Illinois. And uh, there were six of us, ultimately, that um, undertook this project. So um, we had a couple of goals when we started the project, one of which was to learn how third-year medical school uh, medical students seek and use information in the course of their daily activities. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about why that target population was interesting to us. But the other um, thing that we wanted to do is this is a, a group that of health science libraries directors that meet on a quarterly basis. And we were very interested in exploring ways that we could um, do something together. So we had done a couple of other projects in the past, a couple of other activities. And so we just wanted to see um, what we could do together. We had all read the Rochester study um, that Nancy Fried Foster and um, and the folks at Rochester had um, done with undergraduate students. We were very interested in whether this might apply. Um, these kinds of techniques might be able to be used um, in a medical school setting. And so we were interested in doing that. So. Um, one of the reasons that medical school third year students were interesting to us is that they were um, somebody that we identified as being fledgling clinicians. We were very interested in the use of information resources and their, their, their ways of finding information um, in a clinical setting. And so we thought this was an approachable group that we could um, we could talk to. They, they undertake a variety of clerkships or rotations uh, that provide them exposure to a wide range of clinical activities and a variety of different specialties. Um, during this time, they're mastering their core clinical competencies. Those are things like how do you take a blood pressure, how do you take a history and physical exam, um, how do you read lab results, how do you use the electronic medical record. Um, they also um, are uh, undertaking to learn a number of um, professional um, competencies, and that would be um, things like basically how do you how how do you become a doctor? Um, what are um, privacy issues? What are ethics issues? How do you interview a patient? How do you deal with a patient's family? Um, so these uh, in these various clerkships, they're also involved in both inpatient and outpatient um, experiences. So they're either in the hospital or they may be in just a clinical setting, uh, in a clinic setting, in an outpatient. Um, uh, facility. Um, they're also from, um, uh, as I'll show you um, in the next one, we're in a variety of locations. Um, <clears throat> we did um, did know already that they didn't use the physical facilities of the library much because we just didn't see these folks. So they were kind of a black box to us, and we were very interested in finding out a little bit more about how they went about their day. So the six institutions that ended up doing this study are listed on this slide. Um, most of us are located in the Chicagoland area, but our, our colleague Colin, um, Connie Poole at um, Southern Illinois University School of Medicine in Springfield was also involved. Um, and then among the Chicagoland institutions, um, Three of them were located in uh, three of them were located in um, the urban environment and two in suburban locations. Um, so one of the challenges that that we faced um, doing this study was having uh, a large or having a number of institutions involved, and so we had to um, figure out as we went along um, things like how to handle the IRB process, um, which we've already heard is not the easiest thing in the world to do, um, as well as um, just working together with different cultures. So we'll talk. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, Let's talk a little bit. Uh, one of the other things, uh, I just want to back up just a little bit. Target population, the other thing that we knew about these um, that made them a little bit different than the undergraduate students that were part of earlier studies is they'd already completed an undergraduate education and two years of very uh, demanding um, programs in medicine. So we knew that they were highly achieving, highly motivated individuals um, uh, all. So it was not a real broad variety of, of kinds of students, but um, a very particular kind of student. OK, so our protocol basically involved um, giving them a map um, 
well, this was our idea anyway, so here's, the, you know, here's how things work out in reality. We're gonna give everybody a map of the low location where they would be doing their clinical um, and the surrounding neighborhoods. So in our case, it was mostly the University of Chicago campus um, with the hospital um, on the map and then some of the surrounding neighborhood. In reality, some of these folks were doing their clinical rotations in downtown clinics, in suburban clinics, in other hospitals, to which we did not have um, good maps or, or other kinds of location devices. So we had to adjust our approach by um, creating, uh, in some cases, just a grid where we would just ask them to log their time that they arrived at a particular place and left a particular place. So, um, so that was something uh, that we had to adjust as we went along. But basically, they would take a map usually Start with the, the moment they woke up in the morning to when they went to bed at night, and they would just make a mark on that map with the time of when they arrived at a location and left a location. Um, we didn't give them any other instructions than that, just, you know, we're going to map the day, and, but we did tell them that then we'd interview them and ask them about their day. So um, the interview was always done the following day so that they wouldn't forget what they'd done because they're very, very busy people, as you'll find out. Um, and we also did not, um, and, and the interview was very unstructured. We did not have a structured set of questions. We basically used the map as the guide and just walked them through their day, stopping and asking, um, uh, asking them to give us more detail at certain points of the day. Um, we did audio recordings and made very limited notes, so we used, um, uh, two recorders, actually. So here's an example of kind of what one of the maps looked like. This is a very detailed map. Um, one of the things we found out very quickly is unlike the Rochester study where students were going from one place to a cafe, to the library, to their dorm, something, these students would leave their place where they lived in the morning, they would go to the hospital, they would be there for the next 10 hours, and they would go home. So we didn't find a lot of interesting stuff about the map and the, where they were going during the day. But what we did, were able to do then, was just talk with them about, um, about their um, activities through the day. We actually used two recorders. This was at the, at this, at the advice of our um, consultant, who again was Nancy Fried Foster. And, um, we would turn both recorders on, and that was just a fail-safe in case something happened to one of the recorders. And unlike um, the previous talk, we actually um, did buy two recorders for each site. So we had, um, everybody had two recorders that they used. Okay. All right. So, um, <laughs> Once we had these interviews, um, which lasted uh, typically 30 to 45 minutes, um, we uh, had them transcribed. We did not pay a professional transcriptionist. We ended up paying student transcriptionists. We were lucky that we found a number of students who had done transcription work already at our campus. and. Um, and hired them. Uh, one of the lessons we learned about this is that you can only do transcription for about two hours before your brain starts to go um, off. You know, you kind of get distracted and make mistakes. So um, we actually hired three or four different students to do work in chunks of time. This actually worked out with the student schedules because they often didn't have like a whole quarter to, to commit to this, but the idea of earning some money over the course of three or four weeks was a really good idea for them. Um, so they would come in and do some, um, do transcription for us that way. Um, what we lost in that is a lot of the professional transcription um, services that we looked into actually had some familiarity with medical terms and medical products. And so um, I had to do a lot of editing of these um, transcripts and going back and listening to the to the original because they would put in some word and I would be looking at it going, ah, I don't know what they're talking about there. And when I would go back, I'd, I'd say, oh, yeah, yeah, that's MixApp. That's a kind of... Um, um, uh, review tool that they use, and they didn't really know what that was. So um, we did have a consultant work with us, and we did two um, we did a, a two day a workshop on coding and analysis for the team members um, that were assembled from each institution. We also had a previous workshop where um, we uh, spent two days uh, learning interviewing techniques, working with the maps, doing practice, and we pre-tested the, um, the instrument, that, you know, pre-tested that um, method with some volunteers that we got um, uh, from the hosting library that uh, helped, where we held the workshop. So um, after, the transcription, after the transcriptions were done, um, 
each institutional team coded their own transcripts of, you know, not surprisingly, everybody was interested in reading their own transcripts first and not so much in reading everybody else's. Um, but uh, it, was, uh, it was pretty effective for us to do that. And um, I'll talk a little bit more about analysis later, but let me show you kind of what our approach to um, coding was. It was a little bit different than Denise described at their institution. So we had these um, printouts of these transcripts and um, we had six different colored highlighters as, long, as well as um, pens. And we had developed, as we read and reread the transcripts during the course of our two-day workshop, um, some, co some sort of thematic topics emerged and that's what we used as the basis for our draft code book. Um, some of these um, uh, we'll look at on the next screen, but you can see that it's, it's not a pretty thing. You just, you know, there's highlighting, there's scribbling. We tried to work together so that we had consistent annotations and that we were consistently applying codes. So we would, we would work both independently, come back together in a group, check and make sure everybody was coding things the same way. Um, and then following up, of course, later on with phone calls and um, emails and other kinds of ways of checking in to try and keep our coding consistent across all institutions. Um, so these are some of the, um, the themes that we pulled out of the um, transcripts, the coding um, uh, things for uh, learning and practicing medicine in a clinical setting, um, uh, doing it independently, um, or um, other, and other was like in a classroom uh, lecture, um, some other kind of setting like that. Um, Putting on the white coat, this was an interesting one to us. There was a lot of um, mention of things about, you know, what expectations were, what they, uh, what they would and wouldn't do based on what they thought was acceptable, um, talking about what they heard from, from residents, what they heard from their preceptors about um, what was appropriate behavior. Um, and then we also coded um, pulling and pushing information. So when were they pulling information and when were they actually providing information? Other annotations after we developed these basic codes um, that we uh, made on the transcripts were uh, identifying where they mentioned specific resources or um, devices, workstations or mobile phones, um, what kinds of... Uh, uh, obstacles, challenges, workarounds, failures that they encounter in their day. When did they move around? Um, a, a concept of usually. A lot of times they would say, well, I didn't do that yesterday, but usually I do this. And so that's something that we're still puzzling over what, what that means. Is that what they want us to believe they did? Is it really what they usually did? Is it something they, they think they should have done? Um, and then uh, we did code if the library came up at all, although we didn't specifically ask questions about the library. And then we coded for personal interactions. So these were all kinds of things that we put on that. Um, one of the uh, disadvantages of using those transcripts is we don't have an easy way to like share the transcripts. We make color scans of them and you could kind of look at the files, but to, to print them out and dig through them was quite difficult. So we've actually done some additional work um, at the University of Chicago with the, the, the transcripts um, to um, use a tool called deduce. Um, to transfer some of the codes, and we've actually ad adapted them a little bit as we learn more about what it is we're interested in. We've, we've uh, created a set of codes um, in this tool, and we're able to then pull out, highlight excerpts, apply codes to them, and then pull out things like spreadsheets of codes and the excerpts and be able to, um, uh, to tag that to demographic data where they're doing their, um, so demographic data in this case is were they in a hospital setting or were they in an in outpatient setting? Uh, were they in urban or suburban? Um, what uh, rotation were they doing? Was it pediatrics? Was it um, internal medicine? Was it cardiology, surgery, et cetera? Um, so that was something that, oops that we decided that that was worth the time to do. So we're working with that and we're able to um, then, of course, just share these, um, either either go into the tool and use the, the, um, the resources that are in there or pull out things like spreadsheets and provide them to the other um, members of the team. Uh, so basically what, we're, what, what, what we eventually um, found we were doing was we were just looking at information seeking in the wild. So it's not like, what they should be doing or how they were taught to do it, but what are they actually doing when they're out in these clinical environments? So um, here's a few of our results. 
Uh, we did find out that they needed um, very fast-paced um, clinical answers. Um, they often said they had a minute or two uh, to come up with an answer. So what do you think was their first choice? Google. So um, it, it, at first, this was something where, you know, every time they would say something, and then I Googled it, we tried not to, like, you know, take in your <laughs> breath. And, and, you know, so it was this, um, this sort of uh, interested, you know, you would nod and you go, okay, that's interesting. And you'd be like going, oh, my doctor's Googling everything. Um, <laughs> so, um, but, what, but after we, you know, and so we would say to them things like, well, you know, you know why did you choose Google or why did you look at Wikipedia? And it, and it was very interesting because they would do it for specific kinds of questions. So they'd say, well, I was pretty sure I knew that, the, um, that this was an ACE inhibitor drug, but um, I just wanted to check. And so they put in the name of the drug. And you can see on the right-hand side um, of the screen, Google actually provides a structured, short, authoritative. If you look at the sources that are listed here, this is FDA information. This is coming from authoritative information. So even though they're using Google to find it, um, they're often not even clicking on any of those links. They're looking at the context. They're saying, oh, yep, that's right. I remembered that right. And they go on. So that was an interesting uh, finding for us and one where we, uh, you know, after we delved into it a little bit, we were a little bit less dismayed. Um, but then there were definitely times when Google and Wikipedia weren't enough. Um, they were still in the clinical setting. So then they would turn to um, uh, clinical decision support tools. So um, I, I don't think there's a whole lot of health sciences folks in here, but a few of them. These are very, um, um, they're tools that are typically written by experts. Um, they're often ba evidence-based um, kinds of, uh, and they'll often have scorings for how um, strongly evidence-based the information is. They structure it in specific ways. So you, you, know, you get the, the disease, you get the diagnosis, you get the treatment. Um, it's put together in a way that's very easy to search and read um, and not spend a lot of time looking for a particular type of clinical information that you need. Um, these are um, often very expensive for libraries. So it's something that you know we pay for them, but we're we're, we're not happy sometimes paying for them. Um, so that's something that is uh, uh, very. So this one that's shown here is up to date. It was the most ubiquitous one that was mentioned in all of this transcripts that we um, we had, all the interviews we had. But there were other uh, resources, um, uh, drug information resources like LexiComp or Hippocrates, web-based compendia of medical information like Medscape. So, but then they often would have um, a need sometimes to do in-depth research and learning. So they might be um, doing one of the morning rounds. They might have um, been assigned to do a presentation. They want to have a little bit more um, in-depth research there. They might be working on research projects with faculty members. Uh, in that case, they often would turn um, up to other resources. And this is when stakes were higher. So they would use tools like PubMed. Um, and like um, the Cochrane um, Library, which is a, a library of systematic reviews, which are very thorough literature reviews on specific topics um, to, uh, to uh, evaluate the evidence base for particular um, treatments or, uh, or, or uh, uh, therapies for diseases. Um, so that was, uh, they also, uh, the times when they would also turn to other resources is um, when they were studying for specific exams. They have regular exams called shelf exams at the end of each rotation. Um, so they would spend uh, time using other resources like um, study prep materials. Um, they also spend a lot of time in the electronic health records. They go in to prepare before they see patients, to find out what the lab results are, to remind themselves of the history. Um, they have to write notes. Um, the, these are accessed, um, not surprisingly, from the, the workstations in the clinics. But the other thing we found out was really interesting is they sometimes will even be looking at these on their mobile phones. So they have access to them from home and at work, um, and then they can look at them on mobile devices. So that's something that's um, going to be important in a little bit, too. Um, in all but a couple of, and, uh, print was mentioned a lot, um, more than we expected, um, but e-books were also mentioned. I, I don't know how many of you have seen a medical textbook recently, but those puppies are about this thick. And um, carrying them around a clinical setting is not. Um, 
it's not something that's practical. So when they're sitting at home, a lot of times they have a print copy at home or they, they never mention the library, but they, they would talk about having um, a print copy in a doctor's office the doctor might have uh, that was running their rotation might have a copy they could use. But they did talk about using e-books and especially um, there was a real, a real combination of e and print, print and e-books for their study guides of questions that they would review. Um, there were quite a few challenges and obstacles we ran into. Um, one of them uh, was uh, so much reliance on electronic information and the wireless um, cellular coverage in hospitals and other settings was often not good, but other things like security when they were working in the, the uh, public hospital, uh, Cook County Public Hospital, a stroger it's called now, sorry about that. Um, some students said, well, they didn't want to take their iPad with them because they were concerned about the security of their belongings there. So while they still rely on a lot of these electronic resources, there were challenges and obstacles that they were um, in encountering. So then we thought about, well, now we've learned all this stuff about them and um, what is it that we can do um, to apply these results? So. Um, th Across the six institutions, not everybody applied all of these, but there were certainly um, a couple of institutions involved in renovation projects. They thought a lot about um, uh, needs for uh, collaborative spaces or study spaces that came up in um, some of the interviews. Um, some of them, one of the, the institutions, the students said, you know, we can't get to this browser, which is where the, e the like, we, we can't get to the EHR through the browser that's the default on your library workstations. Um, and so they were able to make that change to their library workstations to make it easier, um, extending borrowing periods for um, the devices that were being loaned out. We ourselves um, were, had not pushed out the mobile app for the up-to-date um, clinical support tool. Um, once we heard how ubiquitous the use of their phones um, was and how important it was, we, we moved right away to push that out and um, promote that. Uh, we've made changes in our collection development uh, approaches, much more emphasis on ebooks. Often we were hesitant to buy the ebooks because they're sometimes three and four times the cost of a print textbook. Um, but given that the students were saying, you know, I, you know, I just can't carry a book, we really need access to this, we've, we've changed our approach and um, we're buying um, fewer books, but the ones they're asking for in an e format. Um, so we, we actually um, want to uh, pay attention also to responsive design for mobile devices because of the, you, again, the ubiquitous uh, use of these devices in the, in the clinical setting. Um, we're going to be looking at uh, resources that um, operate well on mobile devices and support the kind of questions that they have. Um, and then I have a little bit on sort of the lessons learned. Um, it was critical that we got support from the medical school administration. Um, we were funded for these um, projects um, through the, the National Network of Libraries of Medicines through a subcontract of one of their outreach grants. Um, they, uh, having the medical school deans um, sign, have, provide letters for that uh, funding proposal uh, was very helpful. They also sent out the emails in many cases to the students recruiting them, so it wasn't coming from the library, it was coming from their own, um, their own medical school um, administration uh, encouraging them to participate. Um, incentives were incredibly, um, uh, incredibly important. They were also the source of uh, difficulty, as you've heard, so we had, um, we, we provided, uh, Five of the institutions, no, I'm sorry, four of the institutions provided $100 Amazon gift cards. One provided a $99 gift card because they ran into problems with the state, um, re restrictions on how much they could offer as an incentive. And one institution, the dean was not willing to support $100, so they offered $25 and they had much more difficulty recruiting participants. Um, Again, you, have, you do have to build in extra time for bureaucracy. Um, we had to go through six different IRBs. Um, we looked into um, serving as uh, the University of Chicago, serving as the, 
the IRB of record, but after I discussed that with our IRB um, director, uh, she encouraged me to um, have each institution go through their own IRBs because it would be much simpler in the end for us all to manage. But that meant that we had to share our proposal, make sure it was consistent. Some people's IRBs took much longer than others. Um, we, we didn't end up starting the interviews all at the same time because of that difficulty. Um, for a project across this many institutions, it was absolutely critical to have one person really take the lead and be um, the, just keep things moving along. So that was something that, that we learned. We thought we might be a little bit more collaborative, but we discovered we really did need one person kind of, you know, riding herd on the rest of the folks. Um, using a consultant for us was extremely helpful. Um, I think as we go along and we learn more from each other, it might not be necessary for every single institution to engage a consultant, but we were um, very new to this. We had very little experience, like Denise, um, doing this kind of interviewing, doing coding and analysis, so it was helpful. Um, and then we also had to use a lot of different approaches for communication. We used an e we had an email uh, listserv that was a private listserv that was set up for us. We used um, we started out using Dropbox. We switched over to Box um, um, a, a Box cloud sharing for our files. Um, uh, we conference calls, in person meetings. Um, we used every tool we could to make sure that we are all working together and um, staying consistent. And then <clears throat> my final slide is just acknowledging um, these are all the members of the project team. So you can see there were a lot of folks involved in this. This was a lot of hard work. Um, it, was, it, it was hours and hours. Um, so yeah, this is something you don't undertake lightly. Um, but we feel like we learned a lot from this. Um, we made some good connections with our, um, our medical school administration and education, uh, educators. And so we were um, pleased to do this. And then we also received funding um, for both our initial um, exploration, the idea of using ethnographic methods, and to um, uh, do the project. So thank you very much.